back to another episode of the Startup Junkies podcast. My name is Victoria Dickerson, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Jeff Amrine and Grace Gill. How are you guys? Doing great. It's yep, Army Navy well. week. Army Navy week. I couldn't be better, right? Hopefully, <laughs> Navy will uh, carry the day this time, but we'll see. Yeah. Well, today we are joined by Peter Mann, who is a U.S. Navy veteran. So go Navy. Former Dell executive and current founder and CEO of Aramzi, an electric motor technology and indoor purification manufacturing company with a mission for clean energy. Peter, how are you? I'm doing great. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great. So just to kind of get things started, we always ask our guests, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us the the origin story, you know, your background and how you came to found Oranzi. Wow. Yeah. So I, I never set out to found a company. Um, you know, I went to college with more of a math um, engineering degree. And so, you know, I just wanted to get a job. And so I, in the 90s and early 2000s, I was in the um, computer industry working for, you know, two Fortune 100 companies, the last last one being Dell. And that's really where I got my kind of on the job MBA in terms of learning how businesses work and the different functional areas and how do you bring a product to market. Um, and in the early 2000s, the dot com bubble burst hit. And that was kind of my push to it's like, the, this isn't fun anymore. We're laying off people every two weeks. Um, life's too short for this. And so that was the push I needed to go off. And I co-founded an e-commerce business um, with a, another person ran that for six or seven years and then used the money from the sale of that to found Aranci in 2009 to create um, really a company focused on improving indoor air quality. My my young son at the time struggled with asthma. And so that was something I was trying to help him and people like him, you know, breathe cleaner air. Very cool. Um, talk a little bit about... Um... So you talked about the motivation behind cleaning this. What were the competitors at the time and, and how do you fit into the, the clean air market right now? Yeah, so back then it was very much a niche market. Um, things changed dramatically with COVID. You know, every, everybody and their brother wanted to be in the air purifier industry. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> the market just, just exploded. So it was very much a, a niche market. There was, you know, not a lot of design in the products. Um you know, the big name, I think at that time was Honeywell. And before that was Sharper Image, um, you know, in the category. And it's it's just completely changed in the last three, four years um, with there's probably 100 brands in the space. Um, and what's interesting now is, you know, now that we're somewhat on the other side of COVID or largely on the other side of COVID, that's, you know, the sales have gone back in the market closer to where they were pre-COVID, but yet there's all this competition. And so there's going to be, you know, kind of a thinning out, I think, in the next two, three years. There's just, there's just too many brands in the space. How do you continue to differentiate? How, how do you how do you maintain that competitive edge and continue to differentiate? Yeah. So two like I guess about three years ago, we invested in uh um a startup that developed a new electric motor technology. And then about two and a half years ago, we merged with that company um, and moved their headquarters to Radford, Virginia. And so we have a electric motor technology that's, you know, hands down, like much better than, than what everyone else has. Most of our competitors are marketing companies. They don't, many don't even have engineering departments. And so we've got really a top level staff of folks who can, you know, develop this new motor technology. And we're in the process in the next two, three weeks of reshoring our manufacturing to Virginia with our motor technology. And so we're really going to be different in that we've really are achieving higher performance, but we've solved the cost issue, which you, which so many companies have with reshoring and making products in the U S um, you know, there's been three or four surveys that show 70 to 80 percent of consumers prefer American made products, but very few will pay even a five or 10 percent premium. And so we've, you know, we've been working on this for two or three years to <laughs> to solve that problem and you know, really excited about what we're coming out with. Oh, that's great. So so based on a better performing electric motor, you're able to reduce both the initial cost. Is it also got an advantage on an ongoing basis, more energy efficient? Yeah, it's uh, we've we've got um, 
it's kind of um i don't want to get it's kind of hard not to get technical when you start sure. <laughs> talking about it but it's a higher efficiency motor you typically you don't see these types of motors in um, appliances but we figured out how do you manufacture these motors or types of motors at a, at a much lower cost in a much more scalable way um, and so we definitely have a performance advantage. The other parts of an air purifier is just like a HEPA filter and the housing, and those are largely commodity, right. you know, plastics. And the, it's really the the engine for the machine. And so we've got a better engine um, and we can make it at a, a competitive price point. As a, as a founding CEO of, of the business, you're now, let's see, 14 years into it. How do you spend your time these days with, you know, with a growing organization, a larger organization? What's what's the best and highest use of your time as a CEO now versus in the beginning? Yeah, so I, I have, a you know, we merged the businesses. I have a, a business partner and he's more on the engineering product development side. I'm more on the marketing side. Um and then the product look and feel and understanding the the customer base. And so I get really excited about all of the the branding, the bringing a product to market, launching a product, telling a story about what we're doing. Um, that that's really where I'm really I'm spending my time is is really more, I guess it's I would say in the marketing side. What are you doing differently to market um, your the clean air and clean energy? Why is that important? Obviously, you mentioned that so that your son was some of the motivation for promoting um, clean air, but just in a big picture, why is that important to you? And how do you like market that? Yeah, I mean, the it's interesting. Um, you know, indoor air quality. You know, there's, if I back up a step, there's <laughs> been a lot of work recently in terms of raising awareness and education about the importance of indoor air. Um, and there's there's a guy at Harvard um, who leads their healthy, you know, um, healthy building um, program where he says your your facility manager or building manager has a bigger impact on your health than your doctor does, because if you're spending eight or ten hours a day in a sick building. <laughs> It's like, and, and, um, you know, and in the past, a lot of what's been done has been around energy efficiency. And it's like, how do we keep the heating and cooling costs as low as possible? But the problem with that is that you don't get proper ventilation. And then the people, they, they never considered the health of the folks in the space. And so that's really important. And it goes for the home as well. It's if you think about, you know, cooking with gas and the nitrogen dioxides and benzenes and other things that they're, they're now starting to see studies where that's really bad for you. And so um, we're really kind of shockingly in some ways on the early days of understanding the impacts of poor indoor air quality. And um, what we're doing is really just trying to raise awareness for that as well as provide solutions that are that are affordable and accessible. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about um, the jump that you made from working at a big tech company like Dell to founding your first company um, and then later on to Aranzi? Because we see a lot of entrepreneurs both on the show and in what we do in Northwest Arkansas who maybe are scared to make that jump or they're thinking about it or they're not sure when is the right time. So talk a little bit about that point in your life and how you were motivated to, to finally make the jump. Yeah, it's quite a it's quite a change because when you're at like a company like Dell, you have a very narrow focus and you have to, you know, there, there's experts in all the different areas. <laughs> and um, and when you start off and do something on your own, you like do everything like you have to understand all the pieces and how everything fits together. And um, and for me, it's it was great because I have complete control over everything. But at the same time, it's it's a ton of work, um, and, and it's really to me just understanding how the pieces fit together. And so I think if you went into it without understanding the different aspects of the business, it could be really difficult because if you don't know what you don't know, um, that could be a challenge. But you know, I'd spent ten years working, you know, at those companies and working across all the different divisions, and so I, I kind of had a good sense um, for how the pieces fit together. Very cool. And then I guess my follow-up question for that is it really does seem like you're a lifelong learner, that you're very observant, working all those different departments, kind of taking the pieces and it leading you towards entrepreneurship. What would you say was the most valuable resource or mentor or place to kind of get that information? Was it just the hands-on information or the hands-on experience at Dell or was there was there more? 
Yeah, I mean, I think you have to get out and talk to people and ask questions and be curious and understand what other folks are struggling with. Um, I mean, I, I'm i kind of like a, I don't know, marketing nerd where I read a lot of books and I watch a lot of YouTube videos and keynote presentations and, and just follow some of the thought leaders. I don't, I tend not to follow people that are kind of um, talk a big game, but don't have a lot of substance behind it. And so there's, there's, there's a difference between like wisdom and someone that's motivational. Sometimes the motivational folks, I think, get a lot of attention and, but it's like, what's the take home value? How do you apply that <laughs> in what you're doing? And so there's just so many good resources out there with the internet, um, you know, back you know, I was I graduated college in the late 80s and went into the Navy. And at that time, that was kind of pre-internet for the most part. There there weren't the job opportunities that there are now. There weren't, there wasn't the access to information that there is now. I mean, it's just, you know, while it's it's a very competitive space, there's just there's just so many more resources available. I mean, YouTube didn't exist. Um, I mean, it's um it, it's phenomenal like what you can learn and how quickly you can learn things now as opposed to you know kind of back in the old days where you just went work for a company what so, is something oh go, sorry go ahead, no you got it go ahead um what is something that you did differently from your first startup into iran uh iran um well, the, the first startup was more of an e-commerce company, and we were just reselling other people's products um, for the most part. And so with Aronsi, we developed products from scratch and brought them to market. And so it was a lot more into the design of the product, uh, the features that were you know going into the products. The first business was good in terms of understanding, you know, I'd been at Dell and I, I developed some functionality for Dell.com and and you know, kind of new e-commerce from the early, <laughs> the earliest days. Um, and in my, you know, the e-commerce business back then, it was five cents a click to advertise on Google. And you know, I went from, you know, we were competing with HP and Compaq, you know, to competing with mom and pops, paying five cents a click <laughs> for really qualified traffic. And um, in and, and it's really changed significantly. But in the new business, it's more around. Um, just, you know, designing products from the ground up that really meet people's needs the best versus selling what's available. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to ask you more, a, a, a bit of a personal question. It's on your profile and you talk about it a lot and it, it's something we care a, a lot about um, a, as well. So you found out late in life that you, you're on the autism spectrum and how, first of all, talk a little bit about that. and then. Kind of relate that to what that has meant in terms of being a founder, working in technology, and and all of that. Yeah, I mean, to me, it was um, well. The story is what happened was my wife was watching. I think it was like CBS Morning Show or something, and they had this woman that was um, autistic was a couple of years ago or more, um, and she was talking about. Um, you know, how she has this hyper focus and restricted interests and um, and everything that she describes, she's like, you need to watch this. <laughs> because, and then I watched it. I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's me. And, you know, and then I um, went and just did a lot of research and there's all these online assessments and everyone is like, oh, oh yeah. You're... <laughs> and then and then it took me about maybe I don't know how many months to find um someone to do like the, the, the actual diagnosis as qualified to, to give that. And, you know, and it's kind of, it was kind of consistent with everything, all the online assessments that I'd done. And for me, it was, it's kind of like you go back and you relive like all, all these life events and see it in a different light. And it's, it's almost like giving yourself a pass for, um, you know, some cases being judged harshly for, for being different. And for me, it's, it's, I, I think it's, it's kind of how I got to be where I am is, is largely in part due to that, um, you know, a huge drive for autonomy. Um, and, you know, that's kind of, I, I, I don't know anyone that who's autistic that worked their way up through a large organization to the top. Um, but I know several folks that are autistic that started their own business. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I, I don't have a lot of interest, but I read marketing books and I think about business and <laughs> like, it's like it never turns off. It's like 
as soon as I wake up, it's going or, um, and you know, it's, you know, there, there's some, you know, whatever you, you know, I, I don't really think very highly of Elon Musk, but he kind of was talking about how many hours, you know, 80 plus hours a week he works. And, and for me, it's like, yeah, that's just kind of how you're wired. Like you're, that's where you get your energy from. Like if you're a social person and, you know, you could spend 80 hours a week socializing and just like, oh yeah, that's great. But if you're, but if, if your interest is work, um, or producing new things or bringing products to market or working on, on problems. And that's where you get your energy. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's definitely an advantage. Um, to, I mean, to have it's, 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 I mean, it's super interesting and it's, it's obviously proven to be an asset for you as, as an entrepreneur, yeah. having that focus and being able to develop a sort of encyclopedic understanding of a topic and to go deep on it. I, there was a statistic. So I sat on the board of a of an, a nonprofit called SLS Communities, which is all about more engagement, better employment opportunities, uh, sort of mainstreaming in, in some really interesting ways, people that are neurodiverse. And one of the alarming statistics I always heard was that the unemployment rate across all people that are neurodiverse and specifically on the autism spectrum is something like 85%. And it's largely not because there's not super high functioning and real assets there. It's because your typical corporate uh, employment managers don't have any idea how to how to understand that someone's on the spectrum or how to interview them the right you know a way that that fits and how to find purpose and 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 sort of uh, job opportunities. What what's your take on some of that? Given that you've lived it. Oh, I, I agree completely. Um, I think when you come in, like for me, um, if I, if someone asks me a question and I'm trying to uh, answer as best as I can and give the best answer, I really can't make eye contact because my brain shuts down. And so I kind of have to like, and so, so you get to a point where you're what they call masking is like, you're kind of like not looking in their eyes, but you kind of make them think you're looking in your, I mean, it's just like you're an actor sometimes. Yeah. And, and it's like, it's a lose, lose situation. Like if, if you go into it and they're like, oh, you're being rude because you're not looking me in the eye. It's like, well, my brain shuts down. So how am I supposed to answer the question? And then, and so do you want like a really good answer or do you want, like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really tricky. And I think it's just the lack of awareness. I think a lot of the stuff with the brain is um, brain awareness and understanding is we're really in the the early stages you know, if, if maybe 2% of, of the folks in the world are autistic, you know, back at, when I was in school, it was like one in 1500 or something like that. And it's, and it's not that there's this huge, like, oh, all these people are autistic now. It's like, that just people have always been there. They were just never diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and there's some of us that, or a lot of us that, um, you know, kind of um, exert a lot of energy and masking and trying to fit in because you're judged so harshly and negatively. Um, you know, when I was at Dell, it was like, you know, I moved up to, you know, senior manager level, but to go up like, you know, senior director or VP level, it was like, I don't, I don't play the political game. Um, and, you know, it's this, uh, I don't even know if soft skills is the right word, but the, the the socializing political stuff. I just wanted to get the work done and let the work speak for itself, and not have to deal with all the parties and you know that that other other stuff, which you know is important for some people, but you know that that's not my game. <laughs> and so and so going off and starting a business is like I don't have to deal with any of that. I can control everything. I have complete autonomy. And, and I can think about how all the pieces fit together. I'm kind of, you know, a bottoms up thinker versus a top down thinker. Um, and so I think it's really that kind of mindset is really, really well equipped to be an entrepreneur. And you're used to overcoming challenges because um, it, it's like an invisible disability that, you know, people think like, oh, you're normal. And they start talking to you and you can, e even though like I miss a lot of like body language um, um, just reading a lot of body language when you're autistic, you know, when someone's judging you, like you pick up on that, like that, 
comes across like very clearly. Sure. And and I think the whole interview process is 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 not very inclusive. Um, I've talked to so many autistic folks who you know just you just can't survive the interview, and um, and you know there are simple ways to overcome it. And and in most cases, when you make an accommodation or a change for an autistic person, you really improve the process for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so some things you can do are like provide the questions ahead of time you know, give instructions on, you know, your interviews at 10 o'clock, this is where you go, this is who you're going to meet with, you just kind of lay out like what to expect, it's setting expectations, and allowing folks to come prepared. Um, And if you're asked a question that you haven't thought about, and you're autistic, you tend to take longer to respond. And so you get this awkward pause. And, and for the autistic person, it's not really an awkward pause. It's like, I'm really trying to get my thoughts together so I can best answer you. The other person has their clock running and it's like, this is weird. And then they tend to make a joke to try and lighten the mood, but it's, sure. <laughs> it's but you, you, you just fail the interview process um, and you never get hired. Or if you do get hired, you can only really move up so far. Uh, and then it becomes like, you're you're promoted from my perspective largely based on your social skills or you know what's deemed as appropriate social skills. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, you know along those along those same lines, have you have you seen? Are there statistics out there that talk about the percentage of entrepreneurs that are somewhere on this this the spectrum? Is it is it higher? You think than than what you would see in normal corporate or organizational settings? Yes, um, I haven't seen statistics, but I am I'm sure that's the case. I think if you there's been studies that have looked at like high tech areas and the autistic rates are two or three times higher. Silicon Valley is like a mecca of autistic folks. Mm-hmm. You know, look at the tech leaders out there. Like who's going to start? I mean, I don't know, Zuckerberg. I mean, just you go down the list. It's like, like <laughs> it, it would it would be shocking if a lot if a lot of them really weren't somewhere on the spectrum or or didn't have some of the aspects of neurodiversity for sure. Yeah. I mean, if you look at, I don't know if you remember the Apple think different commercial or the right. ad, and there's 18 people like Albert Einstein and, you know, I don't know if Tesla was in there, but 13 of the 18 people they've deemed are autistic that they profiled in that, mm-hmm. that commercial, but, you know, Einstein, Nikola Tesla, um, Edison, you know, Edison like went to work and he lived there. He'd work, you know, 18 hours a day. His wife would bring him food and he would often sleep at his office. And he was so focused on, you know, it's like, who else is going to do thousands of iterations of something to get it right and be that hyper focused on it? Right. right. It's like, you know, it's like, it's not the person you want at the party, but if you want to get the job, it's it's really good traits to have. Absolutely. Well, and in those days, they they referred to people as being genius savant, you know, versus because there wasn't an understanding of what autism mm-hmm. was and whatnot. It, it's just it's quite quite interesting, and I think there's a lot yeah. of potential there that can be unlocked if we have a greater understanding of capabilities and how to interact with people right. that are that are on the spectrum. Very interesting. Yeah, I agree, and I think most people want to do the right thing. It's just. You know, just and, and it's changing, um, I think. But I think there's still still just, you know, a gap. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, I think with more and more folks getting diagnosed, it's becoming more normalized. It's not this like, but still 2%. It's not a very high percent. percent. Right. <laughs> right, right. Victoria, land the plane for us. All right, Peter. So thank you so much for just sharing your story and all of that. I mean, I think it's just very valuable for all of our listeners and everybody here to um, just hear that because it's very refreshing. Um, And so one way that we like to land the plane with our guests is to ask that if you could go back in time, you have a magic time machine goes back to whatever point you want before, you know, graduating college or before you started a Ronzi or whatever point, if you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? Hmm. I would say, um, you know, you're going to work most of your life. Like if you're in your twenties, I mean, you could have a 50 year career and you don't have to crush it year one. Um, it always takes longer and costs more 
<laughs> to do. Like we've seen that with our business. Like we've been working on this motor technology for two or three years. Like, and originally we were like, oh, we're going to get this out in a year. And it's like, well, we got to keep refining it. We got to keep getting it just right. And um, it, it, everything always takes longer. So you have to have patience um, and, you know, be able to stick with it. Great advice. Where, where can our audience find out more about you or Ronsi or, or, you know, just in general, what's the best way for them to check you guys out? Sure. Yeah. Our website is aransi.com, O-R-A-N-S-I.com. And um, Peter Mann, um, I'm on LinkedIn. It's probably the best way um, to find me. Um, I pretty much talk about, um, you know, marketing, clean air and autism. <laughs> my, my three areas. Well, keep fighting the good fight. I mean, it's 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 amazing what you've done, and we're glad we had you on today. And and best of luck with all things that that come in the future. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Thank you. We'll see. Thanks, you. Peter. Ecosystem builders, entrepreneurs, chambers of commerce, mayors. If you're interested in taking your economic future into your own hands, we've got a book that can help you. Creating Startup Junkies, Building Sustainable Venture Ecosystems in Unexpected Places is the guide. It's a little bit inspiration. It's a little bit toolkit. What it will allow you to do is take your economic future into your own hands and build a sustainable small business innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystem in your backyard. If you'd like to hear more, check out creatingstartupjunkies.com. The Startup Junkie podcast reaches over 100 countries and has had over 100,000 downloads. If you're interested in reaching some of the most motivated and engaged innovators and entrepreneurs on a worldwide basis, give us a shout.